All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kahnstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Rajat Soni. He's a certified financial advisor with 10 years of finance industry experience, dealing with hundreds of clients on a personal level. As a personal finance educator and content creator, he simplifies complicated concepts with weekly insights on personal finance, investing, and Bitcoin with his audience of over 200,000 followers across Instagram, X, Substack, and LinkedIn. I'm super excited to talk with him as I think people who are like classically schooled in finance, as, as you are, I assume, you know, who now embrace Bitcoin should be applauded for, you know, this turnaround. And I think we'll definitely talk about that. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to welcome you here, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I, I, I'm constantly listening to it. Uh, I, I haven't listened to any of the couple of recent episodes, but I've been consistently listening over the last couple of months or so. Love your content. Nice, man. Well, happy, happy to hear. Thanks for coming on. Like, appreciate I that. love your tweet. So that's, that's great. And uh, yeah, as mentioned, like what I, what I love about Bitcoin is, is, and especially about making a podcast and, and talking to all these different types of people with all these different types of backgrounds, you know, who now see Bitcoin and are active in Bitcoin. Like uh, I, I love these people who are like uh, traders for 30 years on Wall Street, you know, who really profit from a broken system and are now fully into Bitcoin. Like it takes a lot of, um, yeah, personal challenges to, you know, review your world view and then see it in a different way. And I see that with you as well, right? Like you, you have a long, um, uh, you know, personal finance background. I, all your tweets are about Bitcoin, basically, which is which is amazing. And uh, yeah, I just want to start by asking you how how did you first become interested in in finance and uh, and eventually Bitcoin? So, uh, not too long ago, I was actually in a very bad financial position. Uh, mm. I had tons of debt. I didn't take care of my finances. I was spending so much money just on entertainment, takeout. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing with my money. Right? Maybe six seven years ago this was um and then i started learning uh, learning about something called fire fire uh, financial independent retired early uh um, yeah. this was after i finished my the this was i think it was this was during when i was doing my chartered financial analyst so during the during the designation during all my education i always made the assumption that the u.s dollar would be the only currency right you don't you don't think of it from a different perspective the perspective is mm -hmm. that the U.S. dollar is the best form of money. It will always be around. There's no way for it to go away. There's no way for it to collapse. It's always going to be here, right? So I, <clears throat> I've i been posting about personal finance, about inf investing, about stocks, about real estate, all that stuff for about three years. And in that time, I learned more about money. I learned more about Bitcoin. And I learned more about just the financial system than I did during my entire CFA designation like the time when i was studying <laughs> for my cfa right and that that's insane to think about yeah. right i mean most people who do that cfa designation it's a recurring team also as... sorry it's a recurring team also across yes. financially educated people actually yeah yeah no I, that's exactly what it is right i mean in in the cfa we just assume that no other asset will ever take over we can have real estate we can have stocks we can have all that stuff but we can't have anything that, that will replace money Right. So mm. when I when I started posting about personal finance, about investing, I started getting a lot of questions. Hey, uh, I don't like investing in stocks because this company is doing this or real estate is almost like, in my opinion, I mean, I've, I've grown to think that real estate is almost like exploitation, right? Because you're holding something, you're offering it to someone else. And if they don't get it, they, I mean, they're homeless, right? If you're if they're not yeah. willing to pay the minimum price that's available they're homeless. So just over time, it made me think, hey, do I really want to be a part of this system? Do I really want to be thinking about things this way? I mean, when, when you start diving into Bitcoin, when you start putting in the work to understand how Bitcoin works, you realize that the entire financial system is designed to take money from the people who are financially illiterate, right? If you're, mm. if you don't, if you don't understand how money works, if you keep US dollars, nobody's going to tell you, hey, this is you're, you're losing money, right? I think just now in in the time of social media, more people are realizing that this system is a scam, right? It doesn't 
it doesn't work the way it should. I, I, there was a, there's actually a book. I'm not I'm not sure if I can mention this, but this book, of course, is amazing. Yes. The fiat standard, awesome. It, it goes through how money is created in this current system, and then it it doesn't talk about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is the uh, he had, this the same author has another book, the Bitcoin standard. Both books are amazing. I mean, they show you the flaws of the current system, and then how the the new system means to fix all those flaws, right? So, I mean, in my opinion, a lot of financial advisors are going to be coming into this. A lot of financial analysts are going to be coming into this. They're realizing it. If you look on Twitter, there are more CFAs. There are more MBAs getting in on this. So, Yeah. And so how is this current financial system then designed to profit from the illiterate or, or steal from us? So... What most people do today, I've, I've, I've done tons of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. I've done tons of uh, just meetings, webinars, all that stuff. And what most people do today is they save in the currency they're paid in, right? Yeah. So if you think about it, what that means is that they're getting paid in U.S. dollars or they're getting paid in Canadian dollars and they're keeping those U.S. dollars and Canadian dollars in their bank accounts. What that does over time is it gives somebody else power over you. Right. So let's say, for example, if the U.S. government wants to borrow money to do something, they're just going to get a loan. Right. When they get that loan, it seems like, OK, you're not you're you're not printing money to do so. But you you you're you're adding more money to the to the economy. Right. Even if it's just mm -hmm. if it's if it's a loan, it doesn't matter what kind of money it is. It's demand. On goods that are currently available, you can't print goods, but you can print money. Right? So when we're when we're working for a form of money that can be printed at will, and we're saving in that form of money, I I, I mean I learned more from Saifedean's Bitcoin Bitcoin standard about this than anything else. If we save mm. in a form of money that's constantly diluted, constantly being printed, it can be printed at will. We're going to lose all of our wealth, right? And most people are doing that. They're seeing that hey, I'm working so much harder, I'm spending so much more time at work, I'm doing three jobs and yet i still can't even make my ends it make ends meet because my rent is going up right it doesn't matter how yeah. much i save but my rent is going to go up my cost of living is going to constantly increase my the price of my food is going to constantly increase I actually went to costco not too long ago um the same stuff that would have cost maybe 150 dollars uh five six years ago now costs 350 250 dollars so yeah. how are people how are people going to make ends meet? Their income hasn't increased by 40-50%. So that's how the system is broken, right? It constantly devalues the uh the reward you get for labor and it increases the value of everything else. Yeah. Right? So And would you would you then follow the um, the illustration I, I used that before in the in the podcast uh where, you know, if you see all the money, uh, let's say take all the dollars that are in existence, right? And you uh, view that as a as a pizza. Every time new money is created, it does not mean the pizza gets bigger. It means that yeah. the slices get smaller, right? And and if you see a slice as your um, ownership of the amount of dollars, right? Let's say your net worth is fifty thousand dollars or something. Then what the energy that that little slice um, is right uh, you could, that's why the pizza analogy is so good because the pizza analogy has like calories right so one mm -hmm. slice a has a certain amount of calories but once it gets cut in half then that one slice you own one slice you own 50k in in dollars basically but the amount of energy that that captures is half of the previous slice basically and that's why yeah. the prices of the things you want to buy then the the you know the amount of dollar units basically they go up but you still buy the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. I mean, if you if you really want to, if you think about it, I'm not sure how many of your how much of your audience is, uh, of, uh, how many of them are aware of stock splits. So a stock split is basically when a company oh, yeah, share a increases point. to a certain level. So let's say, for example, Amazon. Uh, Amazon shares were at two thousand dollars not too long ago. They did a yeah. twenty for one stock split, one for twenty for one, twenty for one, I think it was. So basically, uh, what they did was they split each share into twenty units, right? So let's say, for example, if you do that, and then uh, the value of the company is going to stay the same, right? It's not like you have more more value. You still have the same amount of value. The what's being created by the company stays the same. But if you keep adding more and more shares and then you take away, let's say, for example, if somebody has one share of Amazon and 
if you split it into 20 shares, but then you give them 19 shares, they have less wealth. They may feel like they have yeah. more. They may feel like, oh, I went from one share to 19 shares. In units, amount of units, yeah. Exactly. That, that, that's what it is, right? It, it, they think they have the same, or they, think, they think they have more shares, but they actually lost value because somebody else took that one share. That 5% is yeah. gone forever and they're never going to get it back. So. And is it then also, uh, well, Safety talks a lot about value also, right? A lot of people, um, and, and of course, you talked a lot about stocks and stuff as well. And I see a lot of people also talk about stocks on Twitter, et cetera. They say, oh, it's gone up in value, blah, blah, blah. But they, they use the wrong words because it, it went up in price, right? It went up in, in, well, the units of dollars again that you see. It went up in nominal not... value. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a better term. Yeah, nominal value. But it's, that does not represent the value. And I feel that a lot of people conflate those two things. And it's also being used against them in a sense, right? That you can see, oh, the S&P 500 is doing great because it's, uh, you know, number go up also there. Yeah. But that does not represent the value, right? I saw a great um, graph, I think, uh, British Hoddle shared that, where you had the NASDAQ, uh, the NASDAQ uh, uh, graph from, I think 1970s or 80s or whatever the introduction was until now, uh, denominated in dollars. And you see like, well, eventually it goes up. It's almost all time high or something. But when you denominate it in the M2 money supply, the amount of dollars, the which is the real value, not the price, then the current point is lower than at the peak of the dot-com bubble. Which is so interesting because you could easily argue that we are way further along technology-wise and that the companies that came after the dot-com bubble provided way more value within you know, the technology sector. But even their value, although it's provably better, got devalued because there is way more, way more money than in, in 2000, basically. And yeah, that always struck me as a great illustration, but nobody looks at it in that way. Yeah, all you see is the nominal value, right? I, I, I like to think of it as with Bitcoin, your nominal value is going to decrease over time, but your buying power will increase, right? So if you have, let's say, for example, uh, over 10 years, you hold one Bitcoin, you spend half a Bitcoin during that time, you'll probably end up with higher buying, more buying power at the end of that 10 year period than you started with, even though you spent half of your Bitcoin, right? With real estate, with stocks, you can keep your real estate, you can keep your stocks, you can keep getting your three four percent cash flow but you're going to end up with a lot less real value yeah. than you began yeah. with right the real value is what you're referring to when, when you say m2 money supply when you when you have those stocks in real estate you're losing value i actually spoke with somebody uh yesterday he was saying he's in pakistan so he was he invests in real estate in pakistan he was saying how the value of his house dropped 30 percent in terms of u.s dollars even though it went up in nominal in nominal figures, right? It went up from 5 million to something like 13 million or 11 million. But for him to break even, it would have had to go to 13 or 14 million. So he lost, he lost value. His nominal value went up the price that he could sell it for. But what's the value of that, the, the nominal uh, currency when you can't spend it on anything, you can't buy anything with it? Yeah. Exactly. So sometimes people joke, right? Like, oh, in the 1960s, a bread was 10 cents and now it's $4. But that's kind of where the joke always ends. You know, mm -hmm. the, the conversation never continues after that. There's nobody who's like, well, that doesn't really make sense. I, I give it, uh, you know, in, in, I give another amount of units to buy a bread. Well, okay or, or something like right? yeah. this, this illiteracy or also, you know, it's not on purpose, of course uh by the people i mean uh, i took me a very long time to realize that all of the stuff that i think i knew about money was was totally wrong like how wh where where does this come from you think I, I i think it's intentional i feel like when if people started uh it starts at the school level right if uh how many personal finance classes did you take in your entire schooling career zero right yeah. why yeah. why is that it's to keep you uninformed, right? I mean, if you start, let's say, for example, if you start, uh, th this is what happened over the last few years, over the pandemic, more people started thinking about personal finance and everything started skyrocketing in price because more people started buying rental properties because they thought, hey, I want to build wealth for the future too, 
my cash yeah. is doing nothing for me. So the entire system yeah. is collapsing because of that. When too many people start, when too many people start uh, building wealth, when too many of the, I guess the, the people at the bottom start trying to get to the top, the entire system starts falling apart. Right. That that's what that's what we're seeing right now, because too many people started um, buying houses, buying stocks. Uh, too many people started getting out of the workforce. They started uh, being able to just live a passive life without have without being able to produce anything. So and they, yeah. they can keep their real estate forever if they want to. Right. They can technically just keep that real estate. They can hold on to it until they're 60, 70. They can pass it on for generations. Right, they don't have yeah. to spend their Bitcoin or sorry, their their real estate. They don't have to spend it. Yeah. They can keep it. Yeah, but now you you turned around obviously after some time. And, and but, so, like, why are so? Uh, I also know a lot of people want to invest, etc. I have a friend who just bought a store with an apartment uh, above it, which uh, I don't know. I didn't tell him. I thought it was a bad idea, but I think it is. You know why? Why are real estate and stocks not a good way to build wealth anymore? I would like to say, I think some people got rich with that. You know, uh, I think a lot of people, especially millennials who are uh, looking for ways to build wealth, end up with these options. But I see you talk a lot about it on Twitter. Like, why is this not a good option then anymore? I mean, I think. I think if you're, it depends on your perspective, right? If you're, if you don't look at it from the perspective of Bitcoin, stocks and real estate are always going to be great, right? If mm -hmm. you don't, if you don't know about Bitcoin, if you don't know Bitcoin exists, stock and, stocks and real estate are always going to be the best, right? They're always going to keep returning more than you, than you would get in a savings account. They'll always return more than inflation uh, in general. Um, I, I think once you, once you actually wrap your head around Bitcoin though, you realize that stocks and real estate are not they're not the they're not the primary asset right they're not they're not prime real estate may be something that's going to continue to increase in value yeah, but because that's scarce that, of course yeah exactly that's the scarcity is what factors in right i think if mm -hmm. you even speak to most real estate investors I've, I've actually mentioned this multiple times real estate is going to decrease in value in terms of bitcoin forever right mm -hmm. if you speak to a lot of real estate investors they don't realize that the reason why they even own real estate is to store value. They don't. They don't yeah. get it, right? They they don't. They don't get it. They don't even think of it that way. They just think of it as, oh, I need my cash flow, right? Saying that, oh, I'm not going to invest in Bitcoin because it doesn't have cash flow is probably one of the stupidest reasons to not buy Bitcoin. I I've, and trust me, I've had that conversation with so many people. It's something that people are going to regret. They're willing to give up on 150, 100% returns because of 2 or 3% cash flow. I mean, even if you think about it, the returns don't matter. Once you kind of do a deep dive into how money works, how Bitcoin works, you realize that this is going to fix a lot of things that, that we are currently dealing with, right? And it, it's the people yeah. who are at the bottom. A lot of the people at the bottom are the ones that are rejecting it, but they're the ones who are going to benefit the most. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting is that when you talk about this, like, and that's also why I think that Bitcoin is a long journey to understand, because when you say like people don't even understand why they have real estate, they think they need the, the cash flow, right? And they say, oh, Bitcoin doesn't have any cash flow, so it's not interesting. But um, when you have real estate, you have occupied mental space you have all your costs uh, uh you need to deal with your tenants and stuff like that you know maintenance costs taxes all all, the, all, the, all these things and so it's not it's not a it's not an easy way to create or earn money right with um, with the cash flow of course and so uh, i agree that the argument uh, bitcoin doesn't have any cash flow is is flawed because well when you have bitcoin you don't have to do anything you don't have to think about your tenants there's no cost there's no maintenance uh, no property taxes no uh, um threat of someone disowning you or uh the place where the real estate is uh, turning into a ghetto or whatever right but once you you know st start going in this direction then you automatically get to like yeah that's why i said mental space or your time preference like safety talks about right it's it's way more it's less about earning money or investing or building wealth it's more about um yeah almost your mental uh your your mental state right the fact that freedom yeah exactly right? because that's, that's, yeah that's, i mean any, if, yeah. You, if you even think about it 
how many people are managing real estate properties full time when they could be doing something else? Right. Except, yeah, that's how my much, point. How yeah. much energy <laughs> yeah. is being wasted? How much? How much labor hours? How many labor hours are being wasted? Right. And when when those labor hours could be going towards something that's a lot more productive, a lot more uh, useful to society. Maybe maybe yes. we wouldn't be relying on people working three or four jobs to make ends meet, while other people can just sit at home and do nothing. Right. Maybe yeah. that wouldn't be the case anymore. Yeah. Yeah, 100% agree. But that's also where you kind of end up when uh, you end up at, at what you mentioned in the beginning, that um, this this owning owning houses, renting them out, it's kind of, I don't know which word you used, but it's it's predatory in a sense, right? Just because I have more than you and I can provide you with a house where the utility value of a house did not change in the past uh, two, two, three, four hundred years, right? A roof. Yeah. Uh, roof uh, above your head and uh, walls for security and warmth. You know, the fact that it got financialized is, of course, a big symptom of of the brokenness of the money. Yeah, I, so I said it was exploitation. Um, I actually had a exploitation. Lot of, yeah, that's better. Yeah, <laughs> I had I had a lot of uh, had a lot of I guess economists retweet me when I said that, uh, and it was really mm. funny because they were saying that oh I'm a socialist. No, I'm not. I don't. I don't care. I don't care about uh, governments redistributing our wealth. I don't care about all that stuff. What I what I care about is telling people about the asset that's going to outperform everything else. The reason why I say that real estate is exploitative is because one group of people owns it. Like let's okay. So so if you think about it, uh, my wife and I we bought a pre construction house in 2018. Uh, since 2018, the house value has increased a certain amount. And now we can, if we wanted to, we could take the equity from the house and we can use it to buy two more houses, right? We could put the and, down. And we you did the, what? <laughs> yeah. We didn't do that, right? We, uh, yeah, I, exactly. I actually, yeah, even, even, uh, I mean, in general, think if you think about it, timing is so important in this legacy financial system that you can't recover if your timing is wrong, right? It, there's so many memes that say, hey, my biggest mistake was, um, being in grade three when the housing crash happened, so I couldn't own real estate. Have you seen that? You've probably seen that, right? I mean, that, that's, no, that's, but I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's the truth, right? That that is something. Just yeah. because you're a certain age, you can't get exposure to real estate. Yeah. Most people who are, I, I have a couple of cousins who are who are around that age. Maybe they're eighteen to uh, twenty five. They don't even think real estate is something they can possibly buy at any age right they they it's out of their minds yeah. they don't even think about it right so yeah. i mean if you think if if you put it in that perspective if bitcoin didn't exist these people would be slaves to the system forever yeah well now that you talk about it i i, I find it interesting because a lot of people talk about you know equal opportunities and stuff like that but this is a great example of you know in more modern times than 20 years ago or 40 years yeah. ago there's less equal opportunity to just have a house for the utility of having a house. Not not even about an investment, right? But but just more um, moving out of your parents' house, uh, uh, living on your own, building a family, stuff like that. That equal opportunity is basically gone, I'd say. But yeah, nobody's absolutely. really touching that, right? Because yeah. when you touch that, you you touch. The flawed system. You make people angry, right? And yeah. when, when people see that, no, they're like, no, the system's built to to make uh, make this happen. I, I've said I've said before, mortgages have actually turned real. The, the mortgages have made the world a lot more expensive. People think, hey, now I can finance a house. I'm so much better off. But at a, I mean, on a Bitcoin standard, people aren't going to be financing their houses. They're going to be buying them straight out. They're going to be saving for a couple of years. Now you're spending five, six years to save up for a down payment. On a Bitcoin yeah. standard with prices going down, five or six years, you're going to be saving for a house instead of saving for a down payment. You're not going to have a mortgage because it won't be profitable, right? Yeah. If if somebody it, banks are going to think of it as, oh, an individual is more likely to default. And because I can't print money to make up for their default, I'm not, I, I can't lend the money. It's not profitable for me any for me anymore. If if one out of these five people default, I lose money. Why would I lend them? Either yeah. either mortgages are going to be at something like twenty twenty five percent 
extremely expensive consistently, or yeah. there's going to be no mortgages. So what's that going to do? It's going to decrease demand for houses. It's going to yeah. make housing prices a lot cheaper. Like we're seeing that right now. Um, I've seen in quite a few instances where I, I so I'm going to say this, uh, I actually have my real estate license. I'm saying this as a realtor, mm. as somebody who, who sells real estate for yeah. a living. It, and because of that, you know, for a fact that I'm not lying here, right? When you look at prices for houses, a lot of people are taking five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar losses, right? Wow. In that's a nominal value. In real value, their loss is even bigger because they have the mm -hmm. inflation to take to, to to account for as well, right? So what they're getting back is worth even less. And plus, they put in their maintenance, they put in their fees, yeah. they have to pay a all fee to actually costs, buy the yeah. house, yeah, right? All that stuff, all that stuff has to be taken account. It, it has to be accounted for, right? Sorry, I. I completely lost track i was just talking about the real estate well where where were you where were you... yeah that 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 the real estate the the the, or the opportunity for people to to actually yes. own real estate you know go out uh, leave their parents uh, build a family etc etc that that is actually gone and then yeah you mentioned that um that when we would have a bitcoin standard that also you know the incentive for banks to have mortgages would go away and that then yes. eventually the housing prices would the house prices would go down to uh you know the 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 utility value or what it's worth perhaps except for uh, yes. you know prime real estate on the coast or something like that yeah no definitely I, I like if you think about it there's people who own thousands of houses right i mean there's uh, i'm yeah. not sure if you know about him but grant cardone Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I saw a name? video yeah. of him. Uh, yeah, yeah, last week <laughs> where he uh, talked about uh, he has a home which is empty, like a huge uh, mansion, and he talked about like should I sell this for Bitcoin? And he made a great case, I think. Yeah, yeah. See, I mean, that's the thing, right? These people own thousands of houses. What's going to happen yeah. when they start selling their houses? What's going to happen when hedge funds realize that hey, instead of buying single-family homes, I should be buying Bitcoin? It's going to yeah. give me much better, much better profits. Why would I yeah. waste my time dealing with these these broke people who maybe can't even pay their rent. I mean, why would they do that, right? They don't want to. Yeah. Their goal is yeah. to make as much money as possible. And Bitcoin is that way. But the thing is that b because Bitcoin doesn't have that physical presence, you're not exploiting anybody, right? Yeah. You're incentivized to create more real goods so that you can accumulate more Bitcoin, right? That code, yes. the, the code is so valuable because of its scarcity, right? I mean, people say, oh, it's this code. It's lines of code. It's it has no physical presence. It's worthless, but that's the thing that that yeah. code has so much value because other people are willing to pay for it, right? Yes. It's like it's like well, the and, information and because on your the computer. people in the network confirm every ten minutes that it's still yeah. there. Also, yeah, I mean, it's like it's well, like your it's yeah. it's like the phones on your on your computer, right? They don't have physical presence, but they're valuable to you because they're memories, right? Yeah. This is a different kind of value. This is more monetary value. You can use it to spend on goods and services that that's what people want right they don't care about they don't care about owning as many houses as possible they they don't care about that yeah before we jump deeper into into bitcoin i want to go back one step when you said you know there's a lot of people who are experiencing they are getting poorer despite working harder right people having multiple jobs who are living paycheck to to paycheck there's lots of videos on tiktok and instagram of people well while they are sipping six six dollar starbucks uh, in their own car <laughs> are complaining yeah. about the fact that everything is so expensive but it's interesting that um especially in this 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 it's kind of this confluence of where all the information is free right so any anyone can figure out basically anything right and they can also share it in an easy way the fact that we now see people share these experiences it's really fascinating to me. Like you see that people who, well, basically through adversity are figuring out there is something going on, you know, with, with the money. I find super interesting. Uh, like how, how do you view this? Like is it, could this be like an accelerant, like more people getting on to this? I mean, like it, it, it's definitely not isolated, right? This experience or realization. I, I agree with you. Um, I think the internet has made it a lot more apparent that people are having trouble. Right before the internet, how would we have figured this out? Right, most people wouldn't be able to have a voice. Right, with with the internet, more people are seeing that okay, other people are in the same situation as me, 
It's not my fault, yeah. right? Even that, okay, even if they're sipping on $6 coffee, for example, uh, if you were to save $6 uh, a month or $6 a day for a month, you'd have, what's six times 30, $180, right? You'd have $180. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, you'd have $2,400, right? You wouldn't even have 20, you'd have $2,200, right? Yep. $2,200 saved for 10 years, $22,000. For 100 years, you have $220,000. Right now, a, a down payment is something like $200,000 on a house, right? It's going to take you 100 years. If you give up your coffee, it's going to take you 100 years to save for that down payment, right? Yeah. Instead of most people see the thing is most people don't understand that you have to buy stocks. You have to buy something more scarce than the currency that you have because they think that that currency is the most scarce thing you can, you can have, right? They don't see it as... Yeah. Uh, this currency is losing value because we're not taught that it's losing value. Right? Mm -hmm. when, once they get to that realization, all, a lot of these people are very smart, right? They they yeah. they just haven't been taught the right things. And why do you think it's so difficult to actually realize this? this? I mean, uh, there's also these memes, right, where you see like, okay, median salary in the US, uh, let's say uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, I'm going to say like $40,000 or $36,000, right? And then it said median home, hundred twenty thousand dollars and now it says median salary thirty nine thousand dollars right it only went up a little bit but medium home four hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars or something right like I, I always think well that should be a signal for you to think like okay if this is really the case i should learn about this because this doesn't sound right <laughs> you know that, yeah. that this is apparently the case but for a lot of people, it's really uh, difficult. And that's also, well, actually, I think one of the reasons why I started this podcast, you know, I, I always mention that if you are a millennial who grew up in the West, you grew up in the best time ever to grow up from any person who ever lived. So you never really had a problem money-wise, right? Well, everyone has personal problems, of course. Uh, everyone has something. But more in general, right, like stuff just worked. But now when, when, when the millennials are at the point where they're starting families and want to buy a house with their spouse or whatever, have one, maybe two, sometimes three jobs and a car, and they, they, they have like the grown-up life that they always um, thought they would have. But now they, they run into a problem, right? But still, it's hard for them to, to grasp that in their mind. Like, how did that go for you? Or what is your experience with people that, that you work with? I think um, so. So I've been posting a lot about this on Instagram. I've been posting a lot about how Bitcoin will probably solve a lot of people's problems. I've been getting a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of people think that it's still a scam. They don't. Uh, they think that the U.S. dollar is always going to be the best currency, right? They they mm. they they're going based on a belief that maybe their parents held, their parents transferred over to them. Even in in mm. school, like if you think about it, we don't really hear about anything about we don't hear anything about where money comes from we don't hear anything about um how money retains its value why it retains its value why it even loses value over time we don't we don't hear about any most people don't do a deep dive on that because i think if you think about it most people are busy either trying to make relationships trying to trying to be happy trying to work trying to make ends meet they don't have time right i, I I'm, con I'm i'm regularly speaking with my wife my wife is a nurse um, I'm telling her you need to learn about Bitcoin, but she, it's because the work that she does is so stressful. So she's not willing to put more time into this. I mean, it's, it's at the beginning, if you think about it, it's a very stressful topic, right? It challenges your beliefs. It, it yeah. completely, it's a new paradigm, right? It's like, if you're thinking most people have grown up thinking real estate is the best way to save. Real estate is my savings account. This is a forced savings account. It's the only way for me to build wealth. It's like taking that belief out of your mind and replacing it with something completely different. People think, hey, physical is what's valuable. Bitcoin is not physical. They think, oh, um, you're supposed to hold your, real, your assets forever. You're supposed to hold houses forever. You don't have to hold your Bitcoin forever. You can sell your Bitcoin. You can use it to consume, right? Even a few weeks ago, uh, sorry, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, uh, I did a I did a podcast with Simply Bitcoin. Uh, I was yeah. I was saying, hey, I, I at that point I hadn't understood Bitcoin completely, right? I at that point I still thought, hey, real estate is still a great investment. But once you once you kind of uh, once you kind of put in the time to understand how Bitcoin works, it's very painful. Like I said in the beginning, it's very very painful. It's going to hurt. 
right? It's going to challenge everything. Once you put in that yes. time, you're going to get it. But most people don't have that time. Yeah, I think it's most people don't have that time. I, I agree. I mean, it took me 10 years to really get to where I'm at right now, Bitcoin, mm. Bitcoin wise. It's that, but also what I try to illustrate that that I don't have a problem feeling, right? In especially in the West, where up until now lots of stuff still worked, right? Like uh, yesterday, I recorded with um, uh, Tony Yasbeck, and he's from Lebanon, and he shared how overnight he lost everything he had, right? And then huh. he was like, "Okay, now I understand I have a problem," but then. It's unfortunate that that you need that in order to actually grasp, you know, what is going on. Like you cannot change. It's it's hard for a lot of people to change themselves before they actually end up, you know, in the real big problem stage. So I also like I agree. It it takes time, obviously, but it's also that right. Like the the it's kind of like uh, like negative forward looking thinking, which is not really an enjoyable activity of course right yeah. so it's uh, it's probably also like a human uh you know your incentive is too strong to just not think about that yeah i mean if you think about it if you can borrow money for zero percent and you can buy a house and you can make 20 percent returns on it every single year why wouldn't you right it's yeah the base of the system is so broken we can create money at will, we can issue it to anybody. We can banks can pretty much do whatever they want with the money supply, right? At the same yeah. time, I don't know if most people know this, but in 2020, if you look at the Federal Reserve website, they actually dropped their reserve requirement from uh, 10% to 0%, right? Most people don't know this, right? So the reserve yeah. requirement is basically if you put your money in a bank account, they they're not going to keep all your money, right? They're going to return. They're going to lend out most of it. So that's that's what happened with yeah. Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley yeah. Bank had a certain number of depositors who wanted to take their money out. They had lent that yeah. money to the U.S. government, right? So yeah. most people don't see that. Most people don't see that back end. They don't care about the back end because it's it's complicated. I mean, when mm. when you try to learn it, it takes some. It takes a lot of time to wrap your head around how things truly work, right? And, and those yeah. things, it, it's almost like it's almost like it's made complicated so that most people will will ignore it and they'll just trust somebody to do it for them. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. I think uh in the EU it's 1%, well not that much better. Wow. Um but yeah, people should realize that when you put money in the bank, you loan it to the bank. The yeah. bank doesn't have to hold that in cash and when you want to withdraw an amount above a certain threshold, they will ask you questions why you want to have your money, the money that you loan to the bank. The, you know, this I always try to use as like the simplest kind of like alarmist signal to say like, hey, learn about this, please. Like, because this is not my opinion. Like, it is really the case, right? This is yeah. This is just how it works. So when you take... A risk with your job or a venture, uh, and you deliver value, and you get value in return, you know, in the form of whatever the money is that you use. When when you deposit it in a bank, you actually loan it out again, and you run even more risk, right? Because when the bank explodes, you can think like, "Oh, I have my uh, what is it in America? FDIC uh, insurance, right? I'll get back up to two hundred fifty k, etc." But if the bank doesn't have that money and it has to come from the government, how do you think the government makes <laughs> makes money, right? It's again from taxes from the citizens. Like I, I just try to talk a lot about this as well with people because you have to understand that that is what makes you stuck in a loop, right? In the loop in, in this broken system where, and that's why I want to make the jump to Bitcoin. Like that is where Bitcoin comes in, right? It's another system. It's another system, a standalone a system where once you understand that you can move from a broken system to a system that is provably working and auditable and all these things, then you are out. Like you can do that today. You can do that right now. You know, take whatever your wealth is and you move it to that to that new system. So if someone sees your content and says, Hey, what is Bitcoin and why should I care? What's like your what's like your reply there? So I try to tell them that it's it's almost like a it's an alternate economy where 
you have a certain amount of money and that amount of money is never going to increase. So let's say, for example, in the current system, you're working for a certain amount of money. That money can be created at will, right? The money that you have, maybe it was freshly printed a few hours ago, right? Maybe you received that money after it was printed immediately. So with Bitcoin, you know for a fact where that money came from. You know every single, every single coin that has ever been issued was created by a miner or it was issued to a miner who put in their time and energy to, to create that, right? They, they actually had to do something to make that coin appear. It didn't appear out of thin air. It appeared because of energy consumption. It, became, it appeared because of a time investment, right? It wouldn't have appeared otherwise. With dollars, dollars can be printed at will. They can be created immediately. So if you think about it, what, there was, uh, there's a tweet um, from, uh, I, I, forgot, I forgot who it's from, but it's basically, uh, why would I work for a form of money that somebody else can create at will? Right? Why? Why yes. are we? Why are we expected to to work forty, sixty, eighty hours a week for a form of money that our governments can just literally press a button and create more of? Right? Why are they collecting taxes from us? It, it's a, it's it sounds like a stupid question. Hey, why why do governments need to collect collect taxes when they can create money at will? Right? Once you once you dive deeper into that, yes. you kind of start thinking. Hey, it sounds so absurd, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, so it absurd. It's 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 funny because uh, yeah, I lo I love this example. Like people would reply to that and say like, uh, oh, it's oversimplifying, etc. But yeah. then you have to say like, okay, but give me the answer, right? Yeah. Like if you can print all the money in the world, why are there poor people? You know, like it's su yeah. it's such a stupid thing to say, but it is rooted in reality, yeah. basically, right? Like that. This is if we can give everyone money, why wouldn't we? do that the answer is because it would devalue all the other money that 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 currently is in there but that nobody <laughs> nobody will say no that, that that's exactly what it is right so with bitcoin you can't create that money out of thin air you can't do that you can't if for if if uh, silicon valley bank collapsed and it was it, it held bitcoin for people the financial system would have been gone right? Our financial system would have, it's like FTX, FTX collapsed. Think about all the companies that the contagion went to, right? All those companies yeah. would have, would have, it's because FTX tried to, to create a fractional reserve banking system with Bitcoin, but it doesn't work that way, right? When you have a true form of money, it doesn't work that way because you can't print your money, right? You can't, you can't. So, so all of that, I guess I'll, I'll maybe, uh, maybe put into a sentence. Bitcoin is a new way to transfer, account, and store for value. It's a brand new form of money that can replace every other form of money that that's ever existed. Right? It's it's a it was almost a, fiat currencies is all, are almost a placeholder for Bitcoin. Yeah, I love that. So, what advice would you give to a millennial who's just starting to explore Bitcoin for for their personal finance? Uh, I actually spoke to my sister in law yesterday. Uh, she was she she didn't really get Bitcoin. She didn't care about it. She started seeing my posts, and of course, she started getting more curious. So I told her yesterday, "Hey, buy a little bit of Bitcoin. It doesn't matter how much you get, even if you buy a hundred dollars, fifty dollars worth, whatever you can, whatever you're comfortable with. Buy a little bit. You'll have some skin in the game, and you'll start you'll start looking at it more, right? She's very smart. She knows. Uh, she she's constantly." sending me articles, sending her sister articles, my, my, my wife, she's sending her news articles, she's sending me just things that I wouldn't even have thought of, right? So now she's bought Bitcoin. I'm pretty sure over the next few weeks, few months, she's going to be asking me a lot of questions, right? I, I think the, the first yeah. step is buying even a tiny little bit, even if you buy five, ten dollars worth, just have more than zero, right? That five yeah. or ten dollars worth in 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 30, 40 years is going to be worth a lot more than it's worth now, right? So the, the amount that she bought, it's going to be worth a lot more, but that, that's the thing, right? I actually created a post. Uh, I, I posted a thread maybe a few days ago where if you invested in the stock market, if you invested $200 a month, you'd be a millionaire after 45 years. If you did the same thing with Bitcoin, it would take you 18 years, right? You don't have to fully put everything into Bitcoin, right? But even if you put a fraction of your portfolio into Bitcoin, I think that's the way to start, even for millennials. I get it. People are worried. They don't understand it. They don't, uh, they, it could pretend, oh, they think it could go to zero. It can't, but it takes a lot of time to actually get to that conclusion, right? You need to, you need to be able to understand the white paper. It'll take some time, but that time is going to cost you a lot 
if you don't buy a little bit of Bitcoin, if you don't buy it just a little bit. I know a lot of people who have bought none. They keep putting it off. They keep putting it off. They keep putting it off. But there's others who yes. bought. They started studying immediately because it, it piqued their curio curiosity, right? It made them think, hey, I'm putting money into this. Why don't I learn more, right? Yeah. Until you buy, you're not going to start. You're not going to start really deep, diving deeper. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Like, I mean, I think it's difficult because it's so new, right? But what you just said hit me when I think like people buying stocks, like if you buy, well, I like the the stock advice, like buy what you know, right? Like if you love Nike, you buy Nike. If you love Apple, you buy Apple like that. That makes the most sense for me. But But doing any other thing, you know, like, oh, I'm buying this pharma company something something or this physics uh, blah, blah, whatever <laughs> whatever company you don't know how they work you don't know who these people are you don't know their product development uh, r d process you don't know their operational excellence like you know nothing about this company right and mm -hmm. there's so much influence internally and externally on this company that you will never be able to fully grasp it, right? Yeah, maybe there are some full-time uh, stock traders that only do that day in, day out to figure out like, okay, how does a certain company work? And then they buy a stock, right? But that's not for normal people. I, like, I would argue that understanding Bitcoin is way easier than understanding you know, any, any company that has stocks on, uh, on the NASDAQ. Yeah, I, I agree. There's people who dedicate their entire lives just researching one company right and they still don't yeah, get to the, exactly. they still don't understand everything right and yeah. if you think about it you can you you don't have to you obviously do the research but bitcoin isn't going to change there's there's no cash flows there no there's no product being produced there's no uh the company is not going to suddenly start supporting certain things that people don't like it's not a company right it's a commodity it's something that everybody can own anybody can own it anybody can uh, they can spend it. They can they can use it. They can use it as a store of value. They can, it, as long as you have a cell phone, you can access Bitcoin. It, it, I've seen uh, the comparison to a global ETF. Bitcoin is a global mm. ETF. That's exactly what it is, right? Bitcoin is, uh, it, it um, you can almost think of it as representing the entire global economy, right? Every everybody can sell goods on the on on Bitcoin. They can receive Bitcoin for it. As more goods are available yep. on the Bitcoin economy, the value will increase. Value will accrue with the people who hold Bitcoin over time, right? As more people enter the economy, I, over the last few months, there are some bigger companies that are joining. Ferrari actually said, oh, we're going to accept Bitcoin for our cars now. As you keep going, as you keep getting more and more companies coming in, people are going to be able to spend their Bitcoin directly. People are worrying, hey, uh, I'm going to pay ta have to pay taxes at some point. At some point, I don't think that's going to be the case, right? I think I think at some point, all these governments are going to be working on behalf of Bitcoiners, right? When when you when you look at it, I think I went on a complete different tangent, but if you think about it, all these governments are going to be benefiting Bitcoiners, right? They're because they know that these Bitcoiners can leave their country with their wealth. Real yes. estate investors can't. Yes. Yeah, I talked right. about this with uh, with Tony yesterday. This is mm. the thing; like, it will turn, it will like align the incentives better, right? Yeah. I um, I listened to a Dutch podcast where they talked about uh, like the an old king of Belgium, or, or I think it was him. Um, oh no, it, it was an old king in England actually, who like introduced taxes, and it started when he wanted to battle like the French somewhere, or some something like that. But it started when he proposed plans. Um, that he wanted to execute, right? Like to defend a certain part of land against the French because they are a threat to us, etc. And that is why I need money from you, my my citizens, basically. And so it was a plan. And then he asked for money. And then you know people people gave money. But now people gave give money without even knowing the plans, right? And sometimes yeah. there's taxes, uh, for example, on plastic uses on uh, fruit or something. And the income from those taxes are not used to get rid of the plastic on on fruits. No. You know, they they get put in, in another a pot somewhere to um, to spend on some other, some other subject, right? So the incentives are misaligned. Like it it should be that the government works for the people. It's not that the people work for the government, which is yeah. now um, the case, right? Because they get money without. Proving which value they they add, right? And I I, I like this other um, 
uh, example as well. Like yesterday, I think there was news about these uh, suicide nets on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It took like, I don't know, 20 years and millions of do- billions of dollars or something to do something like it. It's just so misaligned. But once the the power of the money, right? I think you said it well, like if the economy of Bitcoin gets bigger and more goods and services are traded for Bitcoin, that will give power back to the people and the government will have to be more responsible about why they um, should get Bitcoin from the citizens to extra execute on you know whatever plan they want to they want to execute on so um i really like that line of thought and it's also i think what uh, peter dunworth shares a lot he said that he has like this crazy seven billion or something per bitcoin um uh price target but it's really very simple he says if all the global trade uh, fights every day, you know, daily global trade fights for the issuance of new Bitcoin that day, then that is $7 billion per Bitcoin, which, you know, is probably pretty far away, but it is in line with what you just mentioned, right? Because if and when people understand that Bitcoin is the best money to ever exist, then why would you want anything else for your goods or services to get paid in, right? So that, I, that, I think that's even for, for me a for, very logical argument. I think even based on what he's saying, I mean, it it makes it makes sense, right? Because if you think about it, the value. In, I mean, I'm assuming he's he's saying that in nominal terms, but I mean, even even if he was saying mm-hmm. it in real terms, maybe we'll have so much more prosperity, right? Maybe there'll be so many more things available for people to buy, right? Technology is going to improve. Um, we're not going to be spending all our money on houses, so we're going to be worrying more about how do I improve my health. There's probably going to be things in the economy that exist that will be purely to help people s- sustain a better life right i mean if you think about it i i I, sp- I speak to a lot of bitcoiners just regularly um i've noticed that a lot of them like to spend money on high quality food right mm-hmm. it, it shows you it shows you what their preference is there it shows you that they want they they don't care about immediate gratification they don't care about um being able to a lot of people say hey uh oh on on a lot of my posts a lot of my comments are saying hey uh because i used to post about legacy financial assets a lot of people say hey who's paying you to post this there's no ceo to pay me right there's no marketing you're helping yourself i'm helping myself exactly (laughs) and others and and, and, yeah exactly i mean i have an incentive i educate people about bitcoin and i make money from it that's my incentive, right? My incentive is helping people, but my goal is to add more value. I think that's what, what a lot of entrepreneurs are going to do on a Bitcoin standard. A lot of people are going to be yeah. creating things that never existed. There's pro- Think about how many ideas exist, and these people yeah. are stuck working at Amazon, Walmart, Google. They're, they're doing what, what those companies want, but their ideas are just going to waste, right? There's I, yeah. I personally know so many people who think of crazy ideas, and, and they sound awesome but they don't have the time to execute on them right so well and they're not the right incentive yeah yeah i mean on a bitcoin standard that's the thing they'll have the time to execute because they don't have to worry about working 60 hours a week at a job they hate yeah i fully fully agree i i tweeted this week i think fiat money incentivizes short-term consumption and bitcoin incentivizes long-term building and i think that's exactly um that's exactly what uh what you're saying right and Mm -hmm. That is also, I love that uh, that's what Safe Dean also says in his uh, his book, right? Uh, short-term uh, time preference and long-term time preference. The fact that the money that you use right now, the fiat money that you use right now is deliberately devalued at least 2% a year, which the people in charge agree to is an arbitrary number, right? And in in in, in reality, it's way higher now. I spoke to friends who live in New York. They say like, well, they say inflation is 6%. It's more 50 yeah. at the grocery store. You know, the fact that that is happening right now incentivizes you to do all this crazy stuff and gambling to try to at least mitigate that uh, de- devaluation of the money that you have. But with Bitcoin, it's going to stay the same. And once it, you know... um swallows up all this monetary premium from stocks and, and houses, etc. The the value will also go up. But the whole point is that the value stays the same over 
uh, you know, space and time towards the the future, and that is what uh, creates the the incentive for long term building. Exactly as you just said, like if you know that your money is still worth the same in ten years, then you will also choose to spend ten years on some crazy project that you otherwise would never spend time on. Yeah, I mean that that's the thing, right? I mean, your people. It, it's going to. I think this is going to spark a lot of innovation, right? If you think about it, a lot of companies mm. are creating products that it's it's uh planned obsolescence right it's planned destruction of value like if you think about it apple amazon all these i'm sorry apple and samsung have both been uh sued for creating phones that intentionally break right they stop working their battery battery just dies right they've both been sued i mean if you think about it are they going to be doing this on a bitcoin standard because they know that their reputation is everything, right? If because yes, they're the uh, only yeah, two, yeah. they're the only two that can survive. There's no competition, right? I mean, on a Bitcoin standard, yeah, it's going to be I, I free market capitalism. So companies anywhere in the world can create phones instead of having to rely on the U.S. regulations. Anybody can create a phone. Anybody can create a product that can work. And yeah. something will go. Something will go crazy, right? All these companies. Yeah. If you think about it, people say, "Hey, Apple is the best stock ever." I think it'll be disrupted because of Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin will make it so that the market is free. I think Bitcoin will make it so that these companies have true competition around the world, right? Right now, mm. regulations save them. I don't think that's going to be the case in five, 10 years. I think all these companies are going to be revalued significantly. They're going to be completely repriced. They're going to lose 99. They've lost 99.9% .9 of their value. They're going to lose another 99.9% .9 of their value. Mm. Yeah, I find it fascinating. I, I think next to the videos on TikTok and Instagram about you know people uh, not getting uh, uh, or putting putting ends meet, uh, uh, you, a lot of people also talk about quality of products, right? And uh, when you were just talking, I was thinking about uh, I have a son who had like uh, uh, Lego, Playmobil, and the stuff like like Duplo, like the little building blocks, right? I bought new stuff for him, like current stuff. But I also had my old stuff from 30 years ago, mm -hmm. which was better, which was more sturdy, which is what, like the stuff now is way lighter. It feels very cheap. Actually, one block broke. You know, like it's it's funny to see that that the, the quality, well, it's not actually fun, funny. It's interesting, you know, that the quality of products is just degrading also on yeah. on on purpose, you know, the... the um, they don't the companies are also incentivized to do this right maybe it's not that malicious as how it sometimes sounds but they are incentivized to do that and that's the whole point to align and create better incentives for people to build with a more long-term vision i mean i live in an old house more than 100 years old i have crazy woodwork in this house like there are no straight lines you know like very huh. someone who made a door didn't make a straight door like he he made it nice. Yeah. His incentive was to make it nice, right? And if you buy a new house now, your door, your door is going to be cheap wood, super straight, nothing, yeah. nothing nice. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that is, I think, the whole point about where we could go with Bitcoin also. I think Saifedean, you know, Saifedean talks about that in the Bitcoin standard. He talks about how art is trash now. There, I mean, it's true, right? If you think about it, all the music that you hear on the radio, all these hits, they're... It, it's yeah. they're, they're, it's hits, just, short term hits. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing. There, there's nothing. You don't listen. You don't hear those songs again for you know, after a couple couple replays. Those songs have no value, right? Like with mm -hmm. old music. Like let's say I I like I used to really like uh, Nas Nas hip hop hip hop mm -hmm. music. His his rap songs. Um, he he would tell a story in a lot of his songs. J Cole tells a, a story. Their music is it has a lot of replay value. Like the new stuff. It, it's just wow. If you try to listen to it, it kind of hurts your ears. Yeah, it's ephemeral, right? right? Like that's what the whole media became, just ephemeral, yeah, short-term satisfaction. Easy uh, money. And, and nothing. Yeah, exactly. Easy easy money. But it's also because the people allow it, obviously, right? Oh, I yeah. mean, it, it gets yeah, yeah. consumed. Um, but again, that is kind of like the whole point to to talk about that right like you can get this short-term satisfaction but that does not 
increase the value of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can argue that it actually decreases the value of your life because you yeah. don't know what you want because every new shiny thing gives you a little dopamine, you know, whatever, whatever you're into. But that, that is an endless pursuit of nothingness. Yeah, in a nothingness, sense. exactly. Yeah. So you got into Bitcoin, but what was a belief that made you not get into it when you first encountered it? Uh, I think I first heard about Bitcoin in 2010. And I, hmm. I ignored it because I was like, oh, this is too difficult. I wanted to actually mine in my, in my basement with my computer. I was like 17, 18 years old then. Uh, maybe 16. I, yeah. I think I was younger. Uh, I wanted mm -hmm. to mine in my basement, but I was just thinking, hey, this is too complicated. Screw it. I'm not going to I'm not going to waste my time on this. I'd rather spend my time getting an education and getting a job the way that everybody tells me to. That's what I that that's what I thought. Right. And that was in 2010, 2011. Um, then 2013. I was in university and I was going through my exams and I was thinking, hey, this job is going to make me a lot more money than this Bitcoin crap, this Ponzi scheme, garbage, whatever it is, right? <laughs> and then in, I think it was in 20, I think it was 2017, um, I started a new job, same thing. My job is too, too difficult. I'm not going to waste my time on Bitcoin. This job is going to get me a much better career over the long term. And then 2021, I think, 20, I think 2020 or 2021, I started learning about Bitcoin, like really learning about it, that actually happened because of somebody I met at work. This guy at work, he was telling me, hey, you need to learn about this thing. This thing is going to change the world. I'm so happy that I listened to him with an open mind, right? Before that, I had a closed mind. I was thinking, no, the way that I know things should go is how it, how it should go. That's the only way that I know I'm not, I'm not going to pursue a new path, right? Mm -hmm. After I started learning about Bitcoin, after I started listening to podcasts, started really figuring things out, I actually, uh, I left my job. Right in 2021, I left my job. Wow. Um, I went from somebody who wanted a, a pension, um, being able to earn a, a certain amount of money every single year. My my bank is going to pay for my expenses. I'm going to just stay here for the rest of my life. I went from that to somebody who I, I I don't work for a company anymore. Right? I mean, it's hard. It's actually much more difficult working for yourself than it is working for um, mm -hmm. for a business. Right? I mean, I think that kind of pushed me more into learning about Bitcoin. Because I think right now, value isn't receiving the adding value isn't receiving the compensation that it should, right? I think a lot of people. Um, okay, so let's say I do these live webinars teaching about Bitcoin. I I can charge thirty dollars for them, and I can I can do perfectly fine. But if I just kept that thirty dollars, that thirty dollars is going to lose value. It's going to be worthless, right? Mm -hmm. As long as as soon as you realize, hey, if I exchange my cash flow to Bitcoin. I'm probably going to make a lot more. I'm going to have to add the value up front. And then over time, my Bitcoin is going to rise a lot more than my business can, right? I think a lot of people are going to come to that conclusion. That's the conclusion that I came to. Uh, over the last maybe three months, I think I finally, something finally clicked. Before that, I was just struggling. I was thinking, hey, no, yeah. stocks and real estate are the best way to go. Bitcoin so is- So interesting. I saw that change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw Bitcoin that change in your tweets. Yeah, yeah it, it's funny. crazy, man. Like when, when you see it, you can't, it's true. When you see it, you can't unsee it. And most people are going to continue to say that it's a Ponzi scheme. Most people haven't put in the time to understand how it works, right? So they're never going to get it. They're going to wait until... I, I, I have a feeling most people are going to ignore this until it hits at least a million dollars. Well, to talk, about, uh, to talk about that, I actually had one, one question for you because I saw you retweeted someone uh who was talking about like the the 60 million millionaires in the world mm -hmm. um and there's only 21 million bitcoin but a lot are lost <laughs> yeah. actually right so it's probably more like 17 million um you know let's talk about that there's 60 million millionaires in the world and if any millionaires are listening like why should they get into bitcoin um uh, well i mean if, if you're a millionaire it's because you you probably have assets right you have either stocks you have real estate you have bonds you have something in in the legacy financial system that increased in value exponentially over time right i don't think that's going to continue right there's people I, I actually have a lot of people who are constantly telling me hey real estate is going to continue to perform the way that it has over the last few years if you think about it if real estate prices keep going up 5 10 15 percent a, 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 an entry-level home is going to be 10 million dollars in a few years 
right? Yeah, who's going to buy it? Who's going to be able to buy that, right? And what's the rent? Yeah. How much rental income do you even need to sustain that? Mm. Right? It doesn't make any sense. At, at this point, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. So if you think about it, why not put at just a little tiny amount of money in your in your portfolio allocated to Bitcoin? Right? You don't have to go all in. You don't have to do what I did. I actually sold all my stocks and I bought Bitcoin. I don't tell anybody to do that. Even my wife, my wife, she buys Bitcoin, but she hasn't caught on yet. I mean, she's she's getting there. She's slowly going to get there. And I don't blame her for it. the fact that she bought Bitcoin. She opened her mind and she bought Bitcoin. That puts her ahead of the crowd, right? I, I think a lot of people are going to see that. If you're a millionaire right now, Bitcoin costs $45,000. That's 4.5% of your portfolio. If you can't put 4.5% of your portfolio into something that can potentially be worth so much more, it's it's like insurance, right? If you can't buy insurance, you're you're putting yourself in a situation where one bad uh, one bad uh, catastrophe can can just kill you, right? It can destroy you, right? Yeah. You have nothing. So that's not even about Bitcoin. It's not it's even about, about what your portfolio currently is. It's about right? protection, that, right? That means if, you have a shaky. Uh... The, the, exactly. Exactly. Sense. If you don't have, I think at this point, if you don't have Bitcoin, your portfolio is at risk of going to zero. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, but also when the price goes up, right? And let's say we hit a hundred thousand dollars this year, then it's ten percent. Yeah. Of, of of that one million, and that that is a way bigger, also mental hurdle, I'd say, to get over for people. So, I really like what the British Huddle shares a lot about as well. Like this price. <laughs> It is going to go up, you know, doesn't matter at which pace, but as long as you stay dormant, it will slowly walk away from you and yeah. the decision to actually allocate a portion of, of your wealth. Um, and you don't need to, you don't yeah, need to go is, all in. Yeah. You don't need to go, you no. don't need to go buy a hundred, uh, one Bitcoin, right? You can buy fractions, yeah. right? I think that's the, I think that's the thing that most people don't understand. Most people who are buying stocks, buying real estate, they think, Hey, I can buy fractional shares. I don't have $50,000 yeah. to buy a Bitcoin. You don't have to, yeah. right? You can buy fractional units. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many people don't understand that, right? There's, whenever I, whenever I talk about that, there are so many people who say, hey, I had no idea. Now I can finally start yeah. buying even five, ten dollars $10 worth of Bitcoin every day if I want to. Yeah. So to emphasize for the people listening, <laughs> you don't need to buy one Bitcoin. Yeah. You can, uh, one Bitcoin is divided by 100 million units called sets. So yeah. you can buy one, uh, one, one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin and it's uh, divisible by that. So you can buy any amount uh, of Bitcoin that you want when you decide to, um, to allocate some. All right. Um, I have, uh, I, I have three more questions. I saw you tweeted. If a financial advisor doesn't understand how Bitcoin works, you should not trust their advice. Can you elaborate on that a bit? I, I, so I think that a lot of people who are financial advisors right now, they're going based on education that they got 20, 15, 20, 30 years ago. Right? When, I, when I did the CFA, there was no such thing as Bitcoin. Right? I had to go out of my way. Oh, well, there was Bitcoin. Bitcoin was there, but I didn't know about it. It was out of my. It was out of my vision. I didn't even think of it as something that could make sense. Right. So if you think about it, a lot of the financial advisors that are out there that are very successful today, they're probably a little older. Right. Right. A majority of them are probably in their forties, fifties, sixties. Maybe they haven't even thought about Bitcoin. Right. So if you think about it, if they're not willing to do the research on their own field of expertise. Why would you trust their advice? Yeah, I agree. That, that's it, right? If you don't understand Bitcoin, well, you and you're pay fine. them to do that work. Right? Exactly, you, you're paying that, them one percent. That's why a year. you pay them. Yeah, I and mean, if you if you think about it, you're paying them something like thirty percent of your um, portfolio returns to give you that advice over the next thirty, forty years, right? If they can't yeah. put in the time to 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 listen to a podcast here and there, or to to, to learn about this, it, they can't read a book. Why are you paying them? What mm -hmm. are you paying them for? Yeah. Yeah, fully agree. Like it's uh, one of the things that I now do when I want to uh, give people, you know, the quickest way to understand Bitcoin. I send them the uh, Fidelity Digital Assets mm -hmm. Report. It's called uh, Bitcoin Revisited. It's 23 pages. And it's great, like yeah. really good. 
you know and uh yeah that's just what i do like uh if if uh, this morning i had a discussion on twitter again with some financial researcher who uh, said bitcoin was a ponzi and uh, like the tulips and i said okay you know um well i i said a lot to him like i tried to uh give him some information but then i just point him to this like just read these 23 pages right and then if th those are probably the best uh like con it's probably the best condensed like report that i've read about bitcoin you know if you're like totally new um, and you don't have like the time to read all these uh you know great uh, jeff booth articles for example just read these 23 pages and then uh you know that that should hopefully do it if you're an, 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 you have an inquisitive mind, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, honestly, you don't even yeah, have to read it. A lot of people just don't want to read, right? You can listen to a podcast. You can listen to. Yeah. You can listen to. There's a, there's a, a live reading of. No, sorry, not live, but it's it's somebody reading the big, the bullish case for Bitcoin on YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah right. You yeah. can just listen to that. Listen to that on your on your way to work. Right. I've started sending yeah. that to people because I, I know a lot of people, they just. Oh, don't. that's great. I think it works so well because you can just listen to it whenever you want to. It's an hour and 19 minutes. It's literally 79 minutes of your life. If you can't find yeah. 79 minutes of your life to learn about something that can potentially change your entire life, you're going to lose. Like you, you don't deserve mm -hmm. to build wealth if you're not willing to sacrifice 75 minutes of your uh, 79 minutes of your life to learn about something new, right? You, you, you don't, yeah. you don't deserve it. I mean, I, w I didn't deserve it either. I, I paid, there's a, there's a great, uh, quote. You, you buy Bitcoin at the price you deserve. I bought Bitcoin at the price I deserved. I saw Bitcoin at $3,000 in 2020. I thought it was a scam. I lost out, right? It, I paid what I, I paid what I deserved. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the truth. It's the reality of it. Whoever doesn't, if, if Bitcoin is a million dollars tomorrow, if once the ETFs are out, once all that stuff happens, if Bitcoin hits a million dollars and you own no Bitcoin, you deserve that, right? You deserve to pay ten thousand yeah. dollars for zero point zero one Bitcoin, right? Because you're ignorant, you're not putting in the time. I get it. If you don't have the money for it, okay, that's fine. Put in one dollar. It's not about that. It's about um, not being complacent in your own life, right? Yeah. Like thinking for yourself and and. You know, if you can record a TikTok in your car, sipping the $6 Starbucks, complaining about that, uh, you know, you cannot make ends meet and like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Then you can also put on a podcast while you drive home and yeah. start listening to that thing. Like it's, it's the, th that ethos in Bitcoin of doing the work. You know, I, I think it's not, uh, I tweeted that today as well. Like understanding Bitcoin is definitely not about intelligence. Doesn't no. matter how high your IQ is. It's not about that. It's about being humble and recognizing that what you think you know is probably not true what you believe is probably also wrong which is definitely not a nice experience but that yep. will get you to the starting point whatever the starting point is right listening to that podcast or reading a report or reading a book th that doesn't really uh, matter but it's about understanding that you have to think for yourself and that you're currently influenced by third parties who do not care yeah. about you yeah. as harsh as that sounds right and, and, and it's really and that, easy that to see when, when somebody hasn't done the work right yes it's very easy to see exactly and it, yes it's very yeah. it's, it becomes very apparent as soon as they use the word tulip ponzi once yeah, they say ponzi, those things you whatever, know yeah. uh, intrinsic value yeah. um what else is there intrinsic value tulip ponzi uh yeah <laughs> let's keep it at nothing. that but yeah i fully agree yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Or uh, I rather use money uh, backed by the government. Yes, yes, <laughs> there you go. It's like not that. backed by the government yeah. or governments can ban it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I also saw you tweet or retweet something about, you know, the volatility of Bitcoin and risk. You know, lots lots of people use that use the argument that, volat that use the, the volatility of Bitcoin as an argument against owning it. But you say volatility does not equal risk. Why is that? So volatility is just the increase and decrease in price, right? Risk is the chance of loss. If you understand both, if you understand volatility, if you understand where your asset can go, you need to make sure that you buy your assets with the right time horizon, right? If you're buying Bitcoin with a six-month time horizon, 
you're going to lose your money, right? It, volatility is going to yeah. kill you. But if you have a long time horizon, you're not supposed to buy assets with uh, a, a 60 day time horizon anyways, right? There's no stock, no real estate. You can't, you can't buy any investment with a 60 day time horizon, right? There's, it, yeah. if even even the people who are losing money on real estate right now if they hold for another 10 15 years they'll probably end up making money in terms of us dollars right but right now they're losing five six hundred thousand dollars does that make real estate risky does that make it uh does that make you go broke does real estate is real estate a, a terrible asset no it's not you have to think about that for Bitcoin as well, right? If if you're holding Bitcoin with a, a one month time horizon, you're going to lose money, right? Bitcoin, for all we know, tomorrow it could drop fifty percent, right? If if ETFs are are uh, rejected, maybe people will do something crazy; they'll sell their coins. I don't think that's going to happen, but let, I mean, if that's the case, lots of liquidity mm -hmm. is going to leave the market. People are going to be uninterested. Um, leveraged positions are going to get destroyed. So, of course, short term. You could lose a lot of money, but long term, if you think four or five, six years in in the future, you're always going to make money with Bitcoin because of the way that the asset is created, the way it's issued, right? The issuance is decreasing over time, right? And that four years is historically where the price turns back up, where cycles start. It's because all of the during that. So, so in, in Bitcoin in general, there's a two year up. Where the price goes up, and then two years where the price goes down. The reason why the price goes down is because all of the crap is being washed out, right? FTX, FTX should not have been there, right? If it was the legacy financial system, FTX would be surviving until this day, right? Yep. If if there's no, if that's there's... a great point. Actually, this is the whole point. The whole point is you can only profit from Bitcoin when you follow the rules of Bitcoin, yes. right? And if you try to mess with it, if you try to exploit it in whatever way possible, your paper Bitcoin derivatives, leverage, all these things, that will go very badly for you. And that is the entire point of why Bitcoin is so transparent and has a set of rules that will not be changed, right? Because yeah. in the other system where the rules are changed, constantly and also you know on different levels for different people the closer you are to the money spigot the more you uh, profit from it yeah you know that is where that game does work and is played yeah right but in bitcoin it's just it's not possible and and uh yeah it's a good thought like every cycle there are parties who try to play bitcoin yeah but they they fail at it because um yeah, if you don't follow the rules, you will not benefit from it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if you think about it, even the the money spigot comment that you made, I think that has to be explained. So, a lot of people don't realize that to be closer to the money spigot, you need to borrow money, right? They don't get it because nobody thinks of it that way, right? If you think about it, you can borrow five hundred thousand yeah. dollars to buy a house. You can do that overnight, but if you want to earn that money, it'll take you five, ten years, right? So, if you're closer to the money spigot, basically what you're doing is you're getting access to money as soon as possible. You're buying things yeah. that are scarce and you're pushing their price. Borrowing up. from the future. Exactly. You're basically. borrowing for your, from your future self, right? But that's, yeah. that's what people don't really see. They don't understand. When you don't understand that, schools don't teach that. We don't learn that in school. When you don't understand that, you can't take advantage of the system. You can't make the system work for you, right? That's the thing. Yeah. This current system is based on debt. It's based on people borrowing from their future self taking their happiness from later and bringing it to today mm -hmm. yeah i once got a argument uh, on bitcoin of uh, against me on twitter of a guy who said the value of fiat money comes from the promise of the repayment of the debt and then i said dude <laughs> he was a uh he worked at the central bank actually oh, no. and i said dude that doesn't make and it's not rational it's not a rational you cannot build on that like if you no. really think that that is what you you build upon and also this comment goes for normal people yeah. because if the if the people on the money creation level right the bank level if if they don't repay the debts then the government will step in they will save them and eventually who pays for those debts 
are the citizens, right? Yeah. Are the normal people. So so it's very disingenuous actually mm-hmm. to say that the value of the money you have comes from the promise of someone else repaying the debt yeah. on uh, for which that money was created. It's so disingenuous. It's it's crazy to think actually that some people actually believe that. And there's probably financial advisors yeah. out there who actually agree with that. Right. They think, OK, yeah, this mm. is the this is the reason why your portfolio is going to outperform because of this, this and this. But all those facts are wrong. Yeah, I agree. All right. Last question. I ask everyone the same. What is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, uh, oh, that's a good question. I'd, I, I've heard this. I've heard people answering this question before, but I haven't thought of it myself. Um, I think I think over the long term. Adding value, creating value will always trump everything else, right? Creating true value will trump everything else. And people will know, right? I mean, if you're not putting in the work, people will know. Like it's like it's like it's like with us, for example, when when somebody talks to a somebody when a Bitcoiner talks to somebody who doesn't understand Bitcoin, they haven't put in the work, they haven't created value, they won't understand Bitcoin and it and it becomes very apparent apparent right away. Even if you like, let's say social media, uh, if somebody buys fake followers you know for a fact that they have fake followers because their engagement is trash, right? Everything takes time to build. Everything that you that's worth having takes time to build. If you're not putting in that time, you're not going to get what you want, right? I think that's I think that's something that I'm going to, that, that's a belief that I'm going to hold on to forever. I think the fiat currency system has made people believe otherwise. I don't think that that's how it should work. I don't think that that's the way things actually play out. For people, people think, hey, mm-hmm. if I buy fake followers, my social people will recognize me. People will see me as somebody who's truly adding value. But that's not how it works. You have to actually put in the work, right? If you don't put in the work, you're not going to you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, I love that, man. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'll make sure to link to, uh, you know, your Twitter newsletter, your link tree. I think uh, your handle everywhere is uh, Rajat Sony Finance. Yes. So uh, people can find you uh, easily online. And uh, yeah, I'll keep following your thoughts and tweets with interest and uh, hope to uh, do this again in the future. So, of course. Uh, thanks so much. I enjoyed this a lot. Great conversation. Me too. Thanks, man. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening.